I would like to ponder a question with you. Why are bookstores still so valued by their communities, considering that in the 21st century, readers no longer need bookstores to buy books? My name is Jeff Deutsch, and I've spent most of my career joyfully studying this question, both as a citizen student and as a professional practitioner. I have been a devotee of bookstores as a reader and a keeper of bookshops as a professional bookseller. As such, I have many answers to this question, but today I would like to consider a view through the lens of landscape and environment as I develop one possible explanation of why communities so value their bookstores, and perhaps why communities who don't value their bookstores should reassess their priorities, if only to make their landscapes more beautiful and more profound. What is a landscape ultimately, if not the network of relations that surrounds us, in which we are perennially immersed, through which we develop an understanding of our own body, our own personhood, and our own place in the world. The perpetual unfolding of this world of perception against which we measure ourselves and through which we define ourselves is what we really mean when we talk about landscape and environment. The novelist Marilyn Robinson said that the great service a community performs for its members is giving a sense of the possible, which if the community is ungenerous is the great disservice the community performs. And yet, when we think of landscapes, we often imagine a pastoral landscape or an urban landscape. When we do, we likely conjure certain images. Our landscapes have skies and trees and grass. They might have buildings or hills or both. There is something of the natural world in them and there is something of the material world whose construction tends towards solving our material needs, shelter, goods, services. One of the purveyors of goods is the bookstore. While they are becoming more rare, they have persisted long after other seemingly archaic proprietors, like the video store, have all but disappeared. I am a shopkeep at one of our country's oldest bookstores, the Seminary Co-op. Unlike most bookstores and libraries, the Seminary Co-op is devoted exclusively to books. No coffee, no knickknacks, no maker's lab, no internet access, not that there's anything wrong with any of that. The books create a totalizing environment, a landscape in which one might immerse themselves. In 2021, readers do not need bookstores to buy books, full stop. So why operate a bookstore at all? The answer is counterintuitive. In order to better support our mission, after 58 years as a member-owned cooperative, the Seminary Co-op became the first and as yet only not-for-profit bookstore whose mission is book selling. You can deduce from our new not-for-profit structure that our answer has nothing to do with retail and the business of buying and selling. The answer, however, does have something to do with landscape. And that landscape has everything to do with how we make our way through the world. A primary reason for our persistence and a primary product of pursuing our mission is the landscape of books that we build for our community. I grew up among books in a culture that, thinking them holy and worthy of devotion, privileged books above just about anything else. I am descended from wandering people, people without a homeland. And as we couldn't make our enduring home in a given place, we made of books, enduring books, our homeland. As a boy and a young man, I wandered book-lined spaces, collections housed in my parents' bookshelves, in the personal libraries of my friends' families, in libraries, and most excitingly, in bookstores. Interestingly, I was a rather reluctant reader. All of those books were there, but there was something of a required reading element to it all, something alien, something that distanced me from the collections. They weren't my books. To this day, I struggle with required reading. Give me a week and a stack of difficult books that have piqued my interest and I'll read them with great gusto. But give me a deadline and an assignment and I will find myself resistant to even the most engaging book. The great Chicago poet Nate Marshall once said during an event at the seminary co-op, 
that the greatest thing a poet or poem can give you is permission. A bookstore, too, can give you permission. That is precisely what my first visit to the seminary co-op gifted me. Permission to be among books outside of an institution of learning, outside of others' expectations of me, and outside of any requirement, be it a deadline, a due date, or a commitment to anything other than to consider, perhaps, possessing a book, which meant making it mine as much as it meant owning a copy. Even when I was struggling with reading, the presence of books was meaningful to me. It was the presence of books that developed my lifelong reading habit. Like the sociologist Edward Schills, I have gone to bookshops to buy and browse. I have gone to them to buy books I wanted and because I just wanted to buy a book. And much of the time, just because I wanted to be among books to inhale their presence. Books are talismans of possibility, portals of imagination. They are expansive despite their compact and uniform shape. They represent moods, hopes, feelings, and aspirations. They await our engagement, but once we pull them from the shelf, their gifts unfold before us. The brilliant novelist and cultural critic Susan Sontag wrote of her personal collection, my library is an archive of longings. When we think of landscapes and environment, we often think too literally. We receive our education about facts and customs, about the nature of our society and how we might get along in it. But our schooling can only take us so far in developing our interior landscape. Our emotional and imaginative education must be in some way self-guided. We are the passages between the internal and external landscapes. And this is where books and bookstores can help us cultivate this critically important, if invisible, landscape. Consider this perspective from Richard Wright's book, Black Boy. Reading grew into a passion, he writes, as his trips to the library became more frequent as a young man. The plots and stories in the novels did not interest me so much as the point of view revealed, he says. The novels created moods in which I lived for days. How remarkable. The novels created moods. We know the atmospheric pressure of those moods and how varied they are. We know how they feel. We have barometers by which to measure their qualities. Seems to me that we can learn how to feel in addition to how to think from books. We abide in their landscapes. A bookish landscape, then, is a landscape worth building, considering, cultivating, and defending. Bookshelves create environments that seep into our consciousness and our subconsciousness. They are landscapes as critical to the growth of the human as any natural or material landscape. Being among books, then, being in bookish spaces, is an act of construction. The seminal American poet Walt Whitman told us that books are to be called for and supplied on the assumption that the process of reading is not a half sleep, but, in highest sense, an exercise. That the reader must himself or herself construct, indeed, the poem, argument, history, metaphysical essay, the text furnishing the hints, the clue, the start or framework. Not the book needs so much to be the complete thing, but the reader of the book does. What does Whitman mean by the construction of the poem, argument, history, metaphysical essay, if not the construction of the poetic and deeply principled narrative one tells of themselves to themselves? The narrative one tells of the world to themselves and their communities in their attempt to live a meaningful life. I like to think the reader reads no book as much as they read themselves, as the writer writes no book, but they write themselves. By actively perceiving and learning, we develop our interior landscapes and build our external landscapes, both of which establish our connection to the world. So I will leave you with this thought. As we cultivate our landscapes, let's maintain our open spaces, our skies, our trees, our beloved Lake Michigan, and our constructed spaces, 
our services, our small businesses, our communal spaces. But let's also attend to the elements in our landscape that help us sense and perceive and build a worldview. Let's develop spaces which privilege books and only books. Come visit the Seminary Co-op Bookstore, or 57th Street Books, or Pilsen Community Books, or Women and Children First, or Unabridged Books. Chicago is abundant with great bookstores. Why are bookstores so valued by their communities? Because in some way, we are all wandering people, wandering in search of ourselves. Books and the landscapes they create, both as objects and as mechanisms to deliver the hopes, dreams, moods, principles, and wisdom contained between their covers are exceptional tools to cultivate our own interior landscape, which, after all, is our portable and permanent homeland. And so we may understand, shape, and immerse ourselves in the external world that we might become a more generous community. Mm -hmm.